joint law ILSA program on uh, uh, women's legal issues. I'd like to introduce to you our first speaker, Professor Rutko. Professor Rutko teaches constitutional law, trusts, and estates, human rights, and ethics at the law school. Her writings emphasize human and civil rights. Her only piece on gender law was a study of Victorian attitudes towards prostitution as revealed in statutes passed in England in the mid-1800s. Professor Rico will be speaking to us about the history of women's legal rights, including reproductive rights and Roe v. Wade. So without further ado, Professor Rico. I was asked to talk about Roe v. Wade. Uh, if you read the flyer, you know that uh, the scuttlebutt is that you don't know what Roe v. Wade is about because of your ages. <laughs> and maybe because this is the 40th anniversary of Roe v. Wade, you need to, uh, you would appreciate knowing a little bit more about it. I decided to discuss it in three different ways. First of all, it is the 40th anniversary, and I was going to talk about that celebration, which was in January. January the 22nd was the 40th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. And what you have always in Roe v. Wade uh, is celebrated is uh, mass demonstrations both for and against what it symbolizes. It symbolizes for women's rights groups um, reproductive freedom and the right to choose. It symbolizes for pro-life groups, um, death and murder of the unborn. And so it's a highly politicized issue that um, has two sides. I'm not sure which side you're on. Uh, I want you to know because I come from uh, the pro-choice side. I, I will be, my remarks will be slanted in that way. I don't want to debate the issue. I'm just trying to uh, give you my side uh, plus maybe a uh, an objective look at the case itself. So what happens when you have the celebration? It was in January, and you have a religious co coalition for reproductive rights, and uh, the Unitarian and Universalist Church um, celebrating the opinion by emphasizing programs on reproductive rights for women. And I mention those two because the main uh, protagonist against the Roe v. Wade uh, decision is a religious group, uh, the Catholic group, but we do have religious groups that who in fact think indeed that Roe v. Wade is a good decision. Sarah Weddington is now 67 years old and she celebrated with the pro-choice groups in Oregon. But of course Planned Parenthood and the ACLU are celebrating positively. An interesting thing that happened in New York is that Governor Cuomo came out with a um, equality for rights uh, women bill that, that is being contested with 10 points for women's rights, two of whom, uh, two of which we're discussing today, reproductive rights and uh, uh, the right against um, trafficking. But of course, that bill, although championed by uh, pro-life groups, pro-choice groups, uh, was condemned by Cardinal Timothy Dolan of the Catholic Church. Okay, so that is uh, the first part of what I want to talk about. We're celebrating, I think, today the fact that Roe v. Wade actually occurred. Now I just want to talk a little bit about the case itself. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about are the, are the participants within the case and let you know where they are at this point in time. Um, the um, case itself was the, the opinion was delivered by Justice Blackman, <coughs> and Justice Blackman um, raised the issue uh, or uh, grounded his opinion on the Ninth Amendment and the due process uh, portion of the Fourteenth Amendment to find that it was constitutional. You have to understand that the Griswold case predated Roe v. Wade. Griswold in the 1960s uh, was a case which decided that women uh, who were married, married couples, had the right to contraception. Um, there was a Connecticut law that said you couldn't, if you were married, you couldn't practice con contraception. So the right to privacy is actually born in that case. Uh, Blackman picks up on the right to privacy and says it's broad enough to also include a woman's right 
to choose. Um, following the um, Griswold case, you have a number of cases that come up before the Supreme Court. Each scenario has to be litigated. The use of contraceptive contraceptions by unmarried couples has to be litigated. The court says, yes, you have that constitutional right. Minors right to contraceptions has to be litigated with a case which establishes the right that minors do have a right to practice contraception. So the practicing of contraception is the beginning of reproductive rights, really, um, for women. And um, it is in that right to privacy is broadened to a, uh, include then the right to choose whether to have an abortion. The meat of the decision was that he divided uh, the nine months of pregnancy into three trimesters. The first trimester, up to the uh, first 12 weeks, uh, the right to choose was designated a right to be exercised by women, a woman, in cons consultation with her physician. No government restrictions within the first trimester. The second trimester, up to the point of viability of the fetus, uh, the 24th week, the government began to have some rights, but the rights that, that they could, they could restrict the rights of a woman to choose only if it involved her health. So up until the point of viability, the government does have some interest. What are the government's interests in a pregnant woman's fetus? <laughs> well, <laughs> really two are this choice of a woman. There are two rights that are mentioned in that case, and one is that to, in, to, to protect the integrity of the medical profession and the, the interest in potential life. And so you can see that the point of viability, and everybody knows what viability means, basically it's the point at which a fetus can survive outside the uterus of the woman, maybe with support, um, scientific support, but uh, can exist, it's viable. And he chose, chooses that point basically to show that when the fetus is viable, then the state's interest in protecting the um, developing fetus becomes pronounced. And in the last trimester, um, the, um, the government restrictions can be invasive. So that's the case in 1973. That's the meat of the case. Um, what happens after 1973 until 1992, when Roe v. Wade is arguably overturned in the Casey decision, you have a concerted effort by pro-life people to eat away at um, the rights, reproductive rights of women. How do, you, how do they do this? With uh, prefabricated legislation being sent out to all of the states which place restrictions on the right to choose. And I'll just mention the Casey case, the restrictions in that case. When Sandra Day O'Connor, who wrote the opinion for the <coughs> Supreme Court, uh, decided that the trimester uh, framework that was um, set up by Blackman in Roe v. Wade was not uh, a good way to decide these cases and instead of deciding the cases that came up when you're checking the restrictions as to whether they fit within that first trimester or the second or the third trimester and then giving more leeway to the government <coughs> as the pregnancy progresses, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor envisions a, a undue burden test, which is going to be applied across the board during the pregnancy. All of the restrictions are going to be tested to see if they place an undue burden on a woman's right to choose. Um, these are some of these, and these are typical of the restrictions that are placed on your right to choose. First of all, the spousal notification provision. This, this case came out of Pennsylvania. They had restrictions on the right to choose uh, that fought, that uh, covered the entire period of pregnancy. And spousal notification was defeated on the rationale that if a woman had to choose, had to tell her husband that she was going to have an abortion, she might be subject to economic distress or abuse, or verbal abuse. Now, parental notification, 
minors having to tell their parents or go to court and get a judicial bypass procedure, let the judge decide if they can have an abortion. That's upheld. No problem with their suffering, suffering mental or uh, economic abuse um, from their parents, but that's upheld. Uh, the second restriction, all of the restrictions are upheld except, except the spousal notification. We have a 24-hour informed consent provision in that law. You have to tell, the woman who goes for an abortion has to be told by the people at the abortion uh, facility the problems of abortion. Not only does she have to be told, she has to wait 24 hours before she can make a decision. And that's an informed consent provision that's upheld. In the no public, notice we've had no public funds, so the Hyde Amendment says that Medicaid will not cover abortion. So you have a class, abortion being made a class issue. Um, the other, let's see, we had reporting, we have onerous reporting requirements that are uh, forced upon the doctors and the facilities so that no longer is a privacy issue if you go for an abortion, I mean for a, uh, an abortion, but in fact you're going to have to get be reported. Uh, and that has driven <coughs> physicians out of um, the uh, area of divorce, of uh, abortion. You, we now have many states which only have one abortion center that will do the services. And so in a state, if you live in a state like Arkansas or one of those other states that only has one facility that will give you a, a surgical abortion, then you have to travel many distances and you have Medicaid, no Medicaid to help you. So it, it's become a class issue. Um, those are the, let's see, I think I've told you what those requirements that were upheld were. Now, what I want to do is read you um, Justice Blackman's dissent, or he dissented in part and concurred in part in that Casey case, because it, it encapsulates really his uh, opinion in Roe and what he thinks uh, the problem is with Casey. <coughs> Notice, compelled continuation of a pregnancy infringes upon a right, woman's right to bodily integrity. All that remains in the, from the promise of Roe and the darkness of its being completely overturned is just a flickering flame. Um, a woman is deprived of the right to make her own decisions about reproduction and family planning, critical life choices that this court long had deemed central to the right of privacy. Uh, by restricting the right to terminate pregnancies, state cons conscripts a woman's body into its services, forcing women to continue their pregnancies, suffers the, suffer the pain of childhood, and in most instances, provide years of maternal care. The state does not compensate women for their services. It assumes they owe this duty to the state as a matter of course. Um, so he is very sad that we are allowing the restrictions that are eating away at Roe v. Wade. Uh, and of course, what we've had since the Casey decision, 1992, is a continuation of the restrictions. Uh, state of Arkansas just uh, this past uh, week passed a uh, a, uh, an anti-abortion statute which bars abortions after viability 24 weeks. Notice uh, one of the discussions in case was that medical advances are rendering Roe, the trimester format, um, obsolete, but Blackman in his uh, opinion in the Casey case said that it was certainly a more workable system a rigid trimester system that might be changed in some way. Certainly more workable for the court to deal with than this, quote, vague, subjective, undue burden uh, requirement. Okay, so um, let me talk a little bit about the players. Uh, the woman who argued Roe v. Wade was one of five Texas women uh, who had graduated from law school, 26 years old thought to be the youngest woman who ever argued before the Supreme Court. Um, she's now 67 years old. 
she had, uh, during her, she went to the University of Texas Law School, she just graduated, and those five women were trying to help women get abortions. She herself had an abortion uh, during law school. She was with a man whom she later married, but they didn't think she should have the child, so she had an abortion, but she had to go to Mexico to get it. <coughs> um, the, uh, she, is, uh, she now has, a, her name is Weddington, Sarah Weddington, and she now has a, a, a website and uh, goes around. She no longer practices law, but she does speak for women's rights. Um, the um, Jane Roll, name, her real name is Norma McCorby. Uh, she uh, has written two books. One is I Am Roe. The other one is One by Love. She is now the poster child for uh, pro-life. Uh, movement. She, this is in her. This is her story. The outline of her story. Pregnancy. It was her third pregnancy. She was six months pregnant when the case was filed. She had the child. She had three children. Oh, she didn't raise any of the children. Um, but this is the story of her life. Pregnancy lawsuit. Pro choice. Born again. Pro life. Peace. Nothing was known very much about her, but Vanity Fair in February ran an article about her and interviewed her mother and her lesbian lover for a period of, she was a lesbian lover, she had this lesbian lover for 35 years. And she interviewed both of them, both of them very, very critical of uh, Norma. Connie Gonzalez is the name of her 35-year uh, partner, but they, of course, broke up when she became born again. She gave up lesbianism. She says she's a phony. <laughs> but she did have a difficult life. Her, she suffered abuse from her mother. Uh, her father left her. She was put in a kind of, uh, boarding school, and then she was in a reform school. So by the time she became Jane Rowe, she had had uh, two pregnancies. She's married. She married a guy named uh, when she was 18, and so uh, she she has uh, it's a pathetic life that she's lived. Uh, but when they interviewed her mother, uh, her mother, uh, I'm going to give you some quotes, and you must go and read the Vanity Fair. She drank, took dope, slept with women, but she was not exclusively lesbian. She was with men and women all her young life. Um, of course, when she gave up the, the child that she had during the Roe v. Wade case, she gave it to her mother, legally gave it to her mother to raise. Uh, she had no abortions, uh, no mothering. She had three daughters who fended for themselves. Um, Anyway, it's an interesting, uh, the, the background on the case is interesting. It's an interesting case. You should just, I don't know where you stand on the, um, the right to reproductive freedom for women, but wherever you stand, you should know this history and you should um, realize that there are both sides to the story, of course, and make up your own decision as to who has a better argument. Speaker is uh, Professor Justine Dunlap. And some of you have had the privilege of taking her classes. Um, Professor Dunlap was once a lawyer, as a lawyer at the Legal Aid Society. She yeah. is a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I want to practice law. <laughs> <laughs> as a lawyer um, at the Legal Aid Society of the District of Columbia, she represented parents charged with child abuse and neglect. Now, some years later, she teaches a domestic violence seminar at the law school along with courses in family law, civil procedure, and field placement. She was the director of the domestic violence clinic at the American University Law School for two years in the early 2000s, when there was another VAWA reauthorization bill pending before Congress. Professor Dunlap writes about intersection between child abuse and adult <coughs> intimate violence, and she will now discuss the latest reauthorization of VAWA and what is coverage now means for women in the United States. Thank you. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. You're going to get not just the latest reauthorization of VAWA, but you're going to get sort of the whole history because you shouldn't leave here without that. And I want to connect <coughs> or uh, draw your attention to a connection um, with what Professor Rudko said because in the Casey case, we're talking about a woman's right to um, have abortions without checking with her spouse first. The prime argument that led to that being struck down was that a woman survivor of domestic violence would be potentially subject to increased violence if she told her spouse um, that she needed basically his consent to get an abortion. So there's a big connection between reproductive rights and domestic violence. Um, the Violence Against Women Act is federal legislation that was first passed in 1994. Prior to its passage, it spent, it took about four years to get it passed through Congress. So real efforts started in about 1990, and it was controversial for a number of reasons. One, although assault and battery has always been a crime, the notion of domestic violence being wrong, that, um, and I'm gonna use gender terms here, but talk about that a little later. The notion that a husband was not allowed to abuse his wife is a relatively recent um, occurrence. Indeed, there are some cases that are 100 or so years old that say a, a, a husband had an obligation to keep his wife in line. His wife was essentially his property and he had the obligation to control his property. So as long as the husband did not leave a mark or use an instrument that was wider than a thumb, then that was okay to chastise his property, his wife, and keep her in line. So I try not to use the phrase rule of thumb, knowing its origins are in approval of uh, wife abuse. So we have this history in this country and you know, domestic violence in 1990 when federal acts started, or when there, when there started to be real efforts to get federal le legislation, the legal and social and service arena that we call, uh, uh, that centers around domestic violence was maybe 20 years old. It is not as a a body of knowledge and service and law, not that old a discipline. And, and it was relatively controversial. We'll get to the current controversies in 2012, but even back in 1990, setting the stage, it was controversial. Then the federal judiciary opposed it because they thought it would be bringing domestic violence cases into federal court, and domestic violence, if it was in court at all, was definitely a state court issue, and you're learning some of the distinctions between when someone, something stays in state court and when you have the jurisdiction or power to bring it in federal court. And domestic violence, as were most crimes at that time, was definitely a state issue, and to the extent it went into family law, that too was something that was the province of state court. So there was a lot of concern, and perhaps some legitimate concern, that it ought not be in the federal courts. Um, but Finally, it passed in 1994. The primary sponsors were now Vice President Joe Biden. He was one of the key sponsors of VAWA. And another senator named Paul Wellstone from Minnesota. Um, senator Wellstone and his wife Sheila died tragically in a plane crash in 2002, I believe. And if there's time at the end, I have a couple uh, quotes from Sheila Wellstone. Uh, there's now so, uh, something called the Sheila Wellstone Institute. She, when she came to Washington with her husband when he was elected senator from Minnesota, she sort of took this as her cause to help get the Violence Against Women Act passed and, and support her husband and was a really um, extraordinary speaker in person in, in making this movement happen. <coughs> so it happened finally, initially, in 1994. What did the Violence Against Women Act give us as a matter of federal law. First of all, it is um, strewn throughout the U.S. Code. There is no one place you can go to to look up the Violence Against Women Act. It's not, it's stuck in 28 U.S.C. under the Omnibus Crime Control Act. It's in a Gun Control Act over here. It's in Health and Human Services legislation over there. So it's kind of throughout the whole United States Code. And in fact, I have here a copy of the 2012 amendments that were just signed 
by, or the reauthorization uh, land amendments uh, was signed by President Obama last Thursday. And you can't read this straight through to see how the law has been changed. What you read is something like, um, strike section 1402 of subdivision B of the Victims of Trafficking and Violence Prevention Act and insert in section 1B in paragraph one, but you know, and so you just, it's crazy. You gotta sort of go to other sources to figure out what it, what the changes are, but the good news is I'm gonna tell you at the end what the changes are, but it amends like a gazillion portions of the U.S. Code, so in a, in a way it's kind of hard to get a handle on it. It feels even for uh, law trained people, in some ways it's pretty inaccessible. So what it did initially in 1994 was, one, provide full faith and credit, and I'm giving you the big provisions, I mean there are tons of them, but I'm gonna give you the big provisions. It provided full faith and credit for protection orders or restraining orders from one state to another. So if you got a protection order in Massachusetts and properly registered it when you moved to Rhode Island, the Rhode Island police and courts have to honor and enforce that order. Before then, they wouldn't necessarily have to, and so that order of protection was only good within the confines, the territorial confines of the state that it was um, rendered in. So that was terrifically important to permit full faith and credit. Second, it made or made crimes or criminalized uh, on the federal level now, not state level, but on the federal level, several things, including transporting um, domestic violence victims or survivors, and I use those words interchangeably. There's a, a trend now to say survivors because we're realizing how many um, persons who have suffered domestic violence, what they've done to survive and to live. Unfortunately, sometimes um, they're, they're not survivors, and so I tend to go back and forth between victim and survivors because some don't, they don't always make it. Um, but this criminalization penalized or, or made crime the taking of a survivor across state lines for domestic violence. Some places that's not gonna matter because you're not gonna be um, near state lines, but in jurisdictions like this, where we've got Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, or where I practice, DC, Maryland, Virginia, it can be very um, <coughs> relevant. Also, it criminalized um, stalking, and I'll get to cyber stalking in a second, but it made that a crime, it was something and before, nine, before the 90s, stalking was not, um, you had vagrants, you had people who loitered, but the notion that, that um, people stalked others and that that was dangerous, I mean, sometimes you would make a joke, oh, I'm stalking you, or it's flattering to be stalked. There wasn't a sense of how dangerous stalking really is. Um, so VAWA did that. It had firearm provisions. Basically, if you are a person who is, um, then uh, has received a restraining order against you. The, the statute calls them qualifying orders, but essentially civil protection orders or restraining orders. If you have one against you, you lose your right to carry a firearm. That's <coughs> called the Lautenberg Amendment after a senator from New Jersey. As you can imagine, and firearm debates are quite topical. As you can imagine, though, that was very controversial. It was challenged constitutionally as violating the Second Amendment. It was upheld in many lower courts, struck down in a few lower courts, and finally upheld by the Supreme Court in the Hayes case in 2009. So the firearm provision of VAWA has been upheld. Um, somewhat famously, and how many of you in here have had con law? Some of you, in the first years, you'll get this, you'll get this next year. Um, but VAWA created a civil rights or tort remedy, a civil remedy, not a criminal remedy, for someone who was, um, who suffered harm because they were a woman, essentially. That was a, the short phrasing of it. It talked about gender animus. If you suffered harm because of gender animus, you could sue your abuser in federal court. So it created a federal right of action. That was struck down, that was held unconstitutional in the Morrison case. In 2000, I think. Does that sound about right? Um, and you will get that case in con law, but the sort of, some people thought this was the best part of VAWA because state courts were not giving victims or survivors the relief they deserve, so they thought, 
let's take it to federal court. Well, that was struck down as violating the Commerce Clause. And no one has yet, anti-domestic violence advocates has, have not as yet decided to try to get another version of this that would pass constitutional muster. So that has been struck down and not reduced. The other things that VAWA did was provide money to uh, and grants to a bunch of, this doesn't sound very articulate, to a, a, a varied group of service providers, police, prosecutors, and lawyers. So the notion was, again, early 90s, domestic violence was just, so there were just starting to be laws against it, um, and those laws were uh, being tinkered with and tweaked and trying to improve, and they found just because we had laws against it doesn't mean police were arresting batterers, doesn't mean they were sentencing batterers, doesn't mean there was any place that a survivor of domestic violence could go to escape the batterer. So VAWA put money into things called stop grants, which were basically services to police, shelter services for women, prosecutors, and legal services. The uh, clinic that I did at American University was a VAWA-funded clinic to help represent survivors of domestic violence. And so, um, I have a list here actually of all the funding, not all, but of some of the um, groups in Massachusetts that get stop funding grants. And VAWA, in addition to providing those services, also required states to do data collection. The theory being if we don't know what the problem is, if we can't define the problem, we can't figure out where to target our resources, we can't be very smart, even assuming we have the money to spend, we can't be very smart about where to spend it until we know what the services are. So that's basically the 1994 initial legislation. Four years later, and Skay, I'm looking at the time here, you need to cut me off when you, when you, uh, when it's my time to sit down. Um, not four years later, six years later, in 2000, VAWA was reauthorized as, um, it was said in the introductory remarks um, by Ms. Curley. I was at AU at the time, and there was some concern that it wasn't gonna be reauthorized. People were a little nervous. It was the first time it was up for reauthorization. But no one really, and come to think of it, the Morrison case must have been chugging its way through the lower courts at that point. No one really thought it wouldn't be reauthorized, but there was a letter writing campaign, call your congressperson campaign, that kind of thing. Um, what the 2000 reauthorization did was, of course, continue much of the funding for these stock grants, these services, these legal protections, social services, um, translation services sometimes. And that continued, in some cases, was increased. Um, and it also did two substantive things that were considered much better than they had been done in 94. And that's sort of the history we've now on our third reauthorization. Each time, they continued the money for the grants and programs that were started in 94. But they've also tried to improve the substance of the act, so they've tried to figure out in part by this data collection that was authorized, they tried to figure out what's not working and then have in the new law corrections of it. So in 2000, the provision that's often cited as having been most improved, the most improved VAWA provision award, was the ability for immigrant women to self-petition. Basically what um, was happening is immigrant women who were here legally based on the status of, uh, based on the fact they were sponsored by a spouse who had legal status, that spouse could threaten to basically have that woman deported. They would stop sponsoring, the spouse would stop sponsoring the domestic violence survivor. So VAWA allowed this thing called self-petitioning. So the woman, without the abuse of sponsor, the woman on her own could petition to stay in the country. Uh, then, uh, I'm not an immigration lawyer. Um, don't, I've never played one on TV, but those who were immigration lawyers say that the provisions in the 1994 VAWA Act were simply unworkable and incomprehensible. So, and I see the dean nodding her head, so that must be true. I mean, it was very difficult. Um, 
And so VAWA 2000 streamlined and simplified somewhat the process of self-petitioning for immigrant women who were victims of domestic violence. I will tell you one anecdote. When I was representing, um, and this was in 02, so this was after the, the VAWA improvements, I was representing at a clinic a woman who had, was getting a divorce and also had a self-petition before the immigration court in Baltimore. The family lawyers, including me and my students, we uh, consulted with and sort of retained on the side an immigration lawyer because we wanted to make sure we didn't screw up the self-petition um, provision. So it's been improved, but it still can be somewhat complicated. The other thing that 2000 Amendment did was include dating violence as a criminal act within the definitions of what was prohibited under VAWA, and it strengthened the stalking provisions. I'm gonna fast forward to 05, because if I don't get to 2012 um, really soon, Ms. Curley's gonna be mad at me. So the 2005 amendments focused on prevention services. You know, we're getting, we're helping some of the survivors, let's try to make there be fewer survivors by preventing it before it starts. Uh, it's again continued to strengthen immigration or immigrant provisions. It criminalized cyber stalking. Heck, in 94, no one even thought about stalking, and less than 10 years later, we had this thing called cyber stalking, and that um, can be very scary. It allowed housing protections for uh, survivors who were in federal housing. A sort of zero tolerance policy in federal housing for violence, drugs, all sorts of things. Well, if you're the victim and just happen to be caught up in the situation, we wanted to have provisions so that the victims, the innocent victims weren't evicted, um, got much better at culturally, cultural and linguistic specific services. Um, I'm looking for a document I tried to print out from Massachusetts on our um, something called Safe Plan, which was, I talked about the stock grants in Mass, it's called Safe Plan. You go on the website, and I urge you to Google this when you leave here, Safe Plan Mass Translation Services. You can get the documents in like 20 languages. I was gonna print out Haitian Creole to bring here, but I couldn't read the instructions. To print. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding, I mean, I could translate and translate it, and then I couldn't figure out how to print it. So, that's a result of VAWA. In the 05 amendments, they really tried to be much better on cultural and linguistic services. They also talked about trafficking more, and I don't know much about trafficking, and I hope our, our uh, final speaker, um, when he gets here, can enlighten all of us on that. So that's VAWA 05, now VAWA 2012. When I say 2012, even though I know it's 2013, um, it was supposed to be reauthorized. 2012. It wasn't. It became a political football in the presidential election. The House passed VAWA, the Senate, no, my bad. The Senate passed VAWA, the House refused to take it up. So it expired and was reintroduced in 2013. But you will see a lot of language still um, about VAWA 2012. And that is referring to what just passed and was signed by the President last Thursday. And if any of you came to the symposium on the March 1st, um, Congressman Keating talked about it several times and it had been ha passed by the House just the day before. So what does VAWA 2012 do? And uh, when I say what it does, it will perhaps give a hint of why it's been controversial. First, it ensures coverage for gay and lesbian battery. And I say ensures coverage because it was covered before, but in, in some ways that allowed service providers to say, oh, well, we, don't, we just don't offer that here. We don't have shelters for same-sex battling, or we don't have services, or what have you. So the 2012 amendments tried to make it explicit that it covers same-sex battering, and that in the 2012 amendments put in language that um, prohibited discrimination, and presumably if uh, there is discrimination, there will be litigation for, for discrimination. That is a key provision that had many people opposing the 2012 amendments. They all said they were, uh, the opponents were all happy to, to say that they uh, were against violence against women, but they just didn't like these provisions. Um, five Catholic bishops just came out um, in the last two days as against the amendments because of this particular provision. Um, second, and this one also seemed controversial, but for the life of me, I don't know why. Maybe one of you can tell me. It gives, it being the Bible 2012 um, amendments, it gives tribal courts on native lands, 
which have which are sovereign courts. It gives tribal courts the ability to prosecute non-native batterers who have battered native women on native land. And I guess there's a 1978 Supreme Court opinion that limited that and uh, that prevented tribal courts from prosecuting non-native batterers. So this creates jurisdiction for um, tribes to prosecute for crimes that occur on, on tribal lands. Before, they used to have to send it to the U.S. Attorney. It's not that they were technically without recourse, but they were without control, to be sure. And the data seems to be that the U.S. Attorney could take months and often would decline. And maybe for valid, yes. And uh, that's the subject of Barbara Kingsolver's new novel. Amazing, The Roundhouse. Right. An amazing book, um, which I, it's like reading a, a mystery novel. So but but it, it, it all revolves around the yeah. difficulty that a woman faces when, when you can't prove where the rape right. was. Right. So a native woman who was raped and, and she, she can't prove where the rape was because of her condition at the time of the race, and so neither court would take jurisdiction. Right, it's a, you know, you think of jurisdiction as boring. I mean, we all love Sid Pro, I know that. But this was a, a way to see how figuring out what jurisdiction is may, to, may save someone's life and, and have a, a rapist punished, the rape book. Um, so tribal courts now have jurisdiction. Third, uh, VAWA focuses, 2012 focuses on underserved populations. Here was another criticism that we're spreading it too thin. We won't be able to serve people who are really in danger if we're serving too many. So that was that criticism. It also, importantly for the group here, um, focuses on dating violence that occurs on college campuses and requires universities to track it better and have prevention services. So that's something that I hope we'll see. Um, two things, and then I'll sit down. One, even though it's been reauthorized, part of the reauthorization in light of our current economy was a lot less money. I was just randomly looking at some of, this, some of the amendments here, and a couple stop grant provisions, you know, the money that goes to services went from two million to one million. So it, it's a lot less money, and then we have the sequester, which means even less money. So even though VAW has been approved, the services that will be provided are much less. Um, and then the last thing, um, the good news is there's some data that suggests domestic violence is down by between 63 and 67 percent since 19, since uh, 2000, actually. And so that suggests that some of what VAWA is doing works. I think you've got to temper that with the fact that the victory is precarious, and it's really important that we keep services and figure out ways to provide things as the money from the federal uh, grant uh, dries up a little bit, that I would hate to see this victory of domestic violence going down be erased and start going back up. So that's all I have on VAWA. So we have um, a little video to show you guys on human trafficking before our speaker. <laughs> 
So that is just a little bit of a clip on human trafficking, just to um, put a face on it being in the United States. A lot of people think of it as solely being international, but it is happening in the United States as well. Um, our speaker on human trafficking was running a little bit late, and he was supposed to be here by now. So um, I don't know if you guys want to open up to questions on what you guys have discussed first, and then when he gets here. I'm happy to take questions. I have a question for Professor Rudko. Right. You mentioned that the attorney um, uh, for Roe um, was just out of law school. Mm -hmm. Did she have to, um, I believe that there's some requirement that in general you need to be in practice for five years before litigating before the Supreme Court. Is that accurate? It's a three year limit. And of course she had practice. And she, she was not. She didn't just graduate. She had been practicing a while. So. But she was a very new attorney, 26. What do you usually graduate from law school when you're what? I don't know. 22, 23. So she was probably had just gotten her license to practice before the Supreme Court. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on abortion or anything I said? I forgot to tell you when I before I spoke about uh, the personal matters that were explored in Vanity Fair, the material that's been discovered on Corp McCormick, that she abandoned a home in Dallas and left a bunch of documents there. And that's how they learned all these things about her life. Of course, in her in her autobiography, she's telling you her story, which is from her point. Is she still alive? Oh, yes. And where does she live? She's in Texas. She's and she's making a film. You may want to see this film. It's, it is produced by a Catholic person. The name of it is Dooey, D-O-O-H-Y. And, uh, and uh, one of the uh, main actors is um, a born-again Christian as well, and so she, she it, I'm sure it's a, sort of a political statement against abortion that you might want to look for that. I always think about, when I, when I think about those restrictions that are placed on abortion, I think of Khrushchev. During the Cold War, he um, took off his shoe at a conference and pounded on the table and said, we will bury you. Meaning, you know, this is this is a cold war, not a hot war, and we'll just infiltrate and get rid of you. And I see those restrictions eating away at Roe v. Wade as being sort of that type of an attack to get rid of. Yeah, um, I think uh, maybe two weeks ago, uh, I, she was from Alabama. She was a guest speaker. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, I forgot her name, but. Um, she was talking Todd? No, Todd. Yeah. I want to say Todd. Patricia Todd. Yeah, she was talking about um, something in Alabama, or I don't know if it was Texas, about, I don't know if they were getting rid of contraception, like with birth control or something like that. Are they allowed to do that? Are states allowed to do that? Or I, I think that's she was talking about something like that. Get rid of, yeah, limit contraception. Or oh, uh, um, you know, they will, of course, um, you have to have a prescription for some contraceptive methods. Doctors, it has to be doctor supervised. But can the state pass legislation that forbids Prohibit, it? I don't think so. And certainly not after a Griswold. Um, one thing we didn't mention there now, you know, two types of abortion, surgical abortion and medical abortion. And you. Roe v. Wade is, as I said, a symbol and really has, uh, we don't have too much litigation in this area now, except for uh, demonstrations under the First Amendment <coughs> or abortion <coughs> clinics, et cetera. But um, the uh, limitations that are placed on uh, medical abortions and the shift, the shift, the scientific shift, not only in pretty pushing back the data viability, but in making contraception more available and abortion more available through medical uh, ab uh, abortions. You, the, 
morning after pill, you don't have to have a prescription for that. The abortion pill has to be doctor prescribed and it has to be supervised. But maybe that's part of the shift too. Away <coughs> from, it's going to maybe become a totally private thing if a woman wants to have an abortion. If medical abortions are readily available to a woman and she can medically abort, there's not going to be the, the um, exposure that you see with surgical abortions. Do you have any opinion on um, like religious institutions that are funded, <clears throat> like religious hospitals are funded um, through private means that way having, I know certain, certain ones are trying to get around the mandates like you were talking about the morning after pill or contraceptives and they're claiming like a religious right, like they don't have to do that or they shouldn't be able, do you think they shouldn't have to offer that and that woman should get it somewhere else or do you think they should all have to at least offer contraceptions? Or abortion, or do I think contraceptions should be readily available? Well, I, I'm just I'm spe specifically for like religious hospitals or something okay. that's primarily funded through like a religious. I, I know I, I'm not sure exactly, but I know some areas try and get around that exemption through like the religious beliefs. Oh, you're talking about the Obamacare? Yeah. Business. Oh, okay. Um, I don't really have an opinion on it. Okay. Um, I think contraception should be readily available. I believe in uh, reproductive freedom. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, a woman's right to control uh, her choice. Reproductive life should be free her choice. and open. But whether the government has to pay for it or not, that's a problem. Yeah. <coughs> I'm going to interrupt this question and answer session to introduce our speaker, our, our last speaker for today. Um, it's Mr. Philip Martin. Um, Philip Martin is the Senior Investigative Reporter for WGBH Boston Public Radio, and um, he's a regular panelist for Basic Black, and um, he also reports for PRI's The World and was a host for PBS TV channel's um, presidential coverage of 2012. So, without further ado. First of all, welcome. My apologies for being late. I'm covering uh, the silly season, that is to say the U.S. Senate race, special <laughs> Senate race. And so everything we, related to that race, I'm expected to uh, uh, to cover and this morning. Uh, it was following up on the GOP um, uh, candidates from last night speaking, uh, not too far from here at Stonehill College. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about human trafficking, and I'm going to try to give some definition to the term. You, you saw the film, uh, the, the, the film clip, uh, which, is, uh, which gives you a really good example of what it is that, that we're talking about when we, when we refer to, uh, the, to the term human trafficking. Part of the problem with the term itself is that it doesn't convey the enormity of the problem. It doesn't convey the extraordinary level of uh, exploitation, suffering, physical suffering, the trauma, uh, the the type of conditions that uh, men and women, mainly women and men, I should say, uh, uh, are, suffer throughout the world. It's not just sex trafficking, it's also labor trafficking. It's as much someone being uh, found in a, uh, in a foundry somewhere or in a sweatshop making no money uh, as it is someone you know, basically being found in a brothel somewhere in, uh, in Thailand or in parts of New York. Human trafficking is not smuggling by the way. It's not taking someone across the, uh, let's just say for example, the Mexican border into the United States. It's what happens in the context of that travel from Mexico to the United States. If in fact the woman or man owes a debt, to pay off that debt, they're basically saying, well this is what you have to do in order to pay off that debt. You may have to become a prostitute or you may have to work in a field for five years without, without pay, or little or no pay. Let me give you another example. Recently I was talking to my mom, who is uh, in Detroit. She was a sharecropper, briefly, in, in uh, the American South. Do you know what sharecropping is? Mm -hmm. Okay, sharecropping basically, so you're paying, it's, uh, and she was 12 years old. Her family was sharecropped. She worked on a, on a field in the 1940s in the American South 
Uh, and basically, they worked until they paid off a debt. Now, debt can often be imaginary. That is to say, if you're illiterate, which my family was, you're told basically that you owe such and such and such amount. They show you the ledger. And, oh, you haven't paid off that amount of money. So you continue to work picking tobacco, in this case, uh, they, were, they were doing in southern Georgia. Um, and that is a form of what we now call human trafficking. I point out this example because we use this term human trafficking, but the point is it's a continuum. It is slavery in one form or another. Now, slavery has manifest over, over a, a millennium in many ways. Slavery, uh, if you think about the, the appearance of slavery during the, uh, during the Peloponnesian era uh, in, uh, uh, in Greece, uh, if you think about the slavery in the context of Rome, if you think about slavery in the context of colonial uh, England, or in the context of the United States during the 19th century, uh, they all share one thing in common, super exploitation. The assumption that one group of people is better than another group of people, so therefore uh, you, are, uh, you work uh, because it is ideologically justified, rationalized, that you work for free. Now, in the United States, uh, anyway, I, I was having this conversation with my mom about this series I just finished, which is called Underground Trade. I don't know if you've had a chance to hear it or not on, uh, on WGBH. In Underground Trade, what we look at is uh, the roots of human trafficking, uh, literal roots in this case, because human trafficking, by the way, can take place standing still. You can be trafficked or you can be enslaved without moving anywhere. That's the problem with the term human trafficking, because it, it assumes movement. But the point of the matter is you can be exploited standing in place. Um, and as we've seen in, in many, many examples. The, uh, so in explaining this to my mom, she says, you don't need to explain this to me. <laughs> she said, the reason you don't need to explain this to me is because uh, tw from 12 to the age of 15, I worked um, picking tobacco. Uh, we worked to stay in the house that, uh, that we lived in, in the southern Georgia, a live ball Georgia. We worked to, uh, to make sure that we weren't kicked off the land, to make sure we weren't homeless, but we worked for no money at all. We were paying off a debt. And I thought, you know, you're right. This, I'm trying to explain this to my mom intellectually, and it's not necessary, because she, oh, she knows it emotionally. Now, let's talk about the uh, transition from one form of human trafficking or modern day slavery, if you will, to another. Perhaps the greatest form of super exploitation in the context of this thing we call human trafficking is, is sex trafficking. And in the United States, and I'm not going to get into the numbers, part of, part of the obfuscation or the confusion around human trafficking is when you throw numbers at people. But the FBI and ICE, uh, which is our immigration uh, uh, system, our immigration department, federal immigration department, what they've said over the years is that there are probably, there are perhaps from 20,000 to 800,000 victims of human trafficking in the United States. And that's a credible variance. And that's a problem with the numbers. The problem with the numbers is they're all over the place. It depends on how you start to define what trafficking is. But one thing is clear is when a young woman is walking down, and I'm going to give you an example out of Dorchester, is walking down a street in Dorchester, a van pulls up and they pull the young woman into the car. And for the next two, three years, this woman is prostituted. She was 15 years old. I'm referring to the Tavares case. Is ever, anyone familiar with the Tavares case, which was prosecuted by US Attorney General uh, Carmen Ortiz, and uh, uh, who I know is controversial for other reasons these days. Uh, but she was, uh, her office prosecuted the Tavares case. This was uh, three years ago. And this was a very notorious pimp uh, out of uh, Dorchester, originally from uh, uh, the, the Fall River area, uh, who, uh, who his case basically represents one of the first major cases, test of the uh, Massachusetts new human, uh, human trafficking law. But there are many, many other examples. Where does trafficking take place? Where does tra human trafficking take place? Anywhere. My series, my first series of human trafficking looks at nail salons. 
nil so long. When you think about individuals being exploited, think about, as, as Tom Perez of the Justice Department said, any place where you can basically get away with exploiting another human being and trying to conceal that from law uh, enforcement authorities and trying to also uh, find, try to find an efficacious way to basically make money and hide money, then you look, then it's going to take place anywhere. And so massage parlors are somewhat obvious, and I spoke about that, I addressed this in underground trade. Massage parlors are a point of, of, um, of is, are used largely to exploit women from Asia, uh, from Southeast Asia, from China, so on and so forth. Uh, but nail salons is yet another venue. How does it work? Well, it can be used for labor, and it can use, be used for sex trafficking. Working during the day, being taken to a massage parlor at night. We had this example that was basically proven by a former investigator from the Massachusetts Department of Licensure named Paul Taylor. The Massachusetts Department of Licensure basically looked at nail salons around the state and found that some were open at, uh, till 10 o'clock at night. Some, trans some credit card transactions were taking place at 2 in the morning. Now, no, if any of you have your, get your nails done, I'm sure you don't go to a nail salon at 10 o'clock at night, and I'm sure you don't, you don't, uh, uh, you don't make a transaction at 2 o'clock in the morning. That's how they were able to determine that something else was going on that was illicit, that was illegal. Um, and this is just uh, one example. Let me give you another example of how human trafficking takes place. How many of you have taken the drive from here to New York City? Which way do you go? Hmm? 195? 195. Okay, well, any, anywhere, anyone have a, another way of getting down to? Uh, 495. 495, and any other ways? The Mass Pike. I'm sorry? The Mass Pike. Mass Pike. Doesn't matter how you go. The same routes that you travel, the same routes to some of the same places where you stop that get a bite, some of the same places where you hop on the boat bus, or fun walk, or get on the ab track, are the same routes taken by human traffickers. Talking to a police officer, the head of the Massachusetts Transportation Police a few weeks ago uh, for the series Underground Trade, what he said was here at South Station, as we were walking around, victims come in and out all the time and we don't have a clue. Why? Because they look like you and I. What we look for, he said, are signs of duress, signs of trauma, signs that someone is doing something against their will. And it's not always easy. Because human trafficking, as, um, as a police officer who I uh, went on patrol with in Providence pointed out, is not necessarily, and quite often it isn't, someone who's chained to a radiator. It's not a, a, a woman who's basically locked in a room and can't get out. But you have those examples, too, including in Providence two years ago, another um, a very well-known case. It's not someone, you know, like who's locked in a dungeon and can't get out. It's not always bars on a window. The, in fact, the majority of human trafficking, if you talk about it, for example, in the context of immigrant women in the United States coming here looking for a better life, arriving in the United States, finding out that that job they were promised when they left Fujian, China, or when they left Bangkok, Thailand, or when they left Costa Rica, or the Dominican Republic, that job doesn't exist. And so you arrive thinking you have that job that was promised as a teacher's aid. Yes, that even, that is, even that is an example. Or as a, or as a, as a nurse or as a waitress. Most often this happens to poor women, but it also happens to middle class women in China. They arrive here, and I interviewed a woman through the New York Asian Women's Center, uh, in fact several women, and this example was, was repeated over and over and over again. Promised a job, got to New York's Chinatown. Uh, in New York's Chinatown, found out those jobs did not exist then told by the person who helped arrange for them to come to the United States, 
sometimes at a cost of uh, the average cost coming out of China uh, is about $20,000 uh, for illegal entry into the United States. That is to say, faking passports, faking papers, so on and so forth. And, the, and these women, sometimes men, they come here for the, for the reasons anyone comes to a, a, a country that has a higher level of, uh, of uh, wealth than, than, though China, of course, you can, you can argue how, what that's going to look like in the future, but you still have lots of people coming here. They owe this money, and so how are you going to pay this money they're told? The one woman I interviewed was, um, ended up in a massage parlor in Baltimore. She said before she got to the massage parlor in Baltimore, she was in a car, in a van actually, with four other women. And they're driving everywhere. The provenance, where this starts, uh, it usually is out of Queens, New York. Queens, New York is a major hub for human trafficking on the East Coast. And from Queens, New York, it's sort of, think about the, uh, uh, think about a, a, the spiral. You have roads leading up into New England. The, the Attorney General and Martha Coakley, the, uh, Martha Coakley says, they call the Northeast Corridor of, of Trafficking where coming out of, of Queens, New York, jetting up through, uh, through New England, Hartford, Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, Boston, Massachusetts, Portland, throughout New Hampshire, women are basically dropped off in different places. Where are they normally dropped off? Massage parlors. It's usually massage parlors, but sometimes it's apartments. Uh, sometimes it's, um, it's uh, to, to a smaller degree, nail salons. That is, again, I, I don't want to overemphasize that because that is not as common as we might think, but it's also not as uncommon as we might think. But the massage parlor business has blown up. I mean, it's gigantic in the United States these days. And a lot of it is used for illicit activity. So this woman ended up in a, uh, as her friends, or actually not people she really knew, other strangers, but people she got to know in the car, as they were being dropped off in different places around the Northeast, she was taken and dropped off in Baltimore. The reason she's even able to talk about this, the, the reason this story came to light, is because she was lucky. Not long after being at this massage parlor, and not long after being exploited in the most horrible ways uh, that you can imagine, uh, a mother too, by the way, this woman uh, was rescued by the Baltimore police. Uh, there was a raid. Someone tipped off the police. Uh, someone had actually gone in for a real massage. <laughs> and said, well, this is the, something else is going on here. No kidding. Something else is going on here. They called the police. The police raided the place. This woman was, um, was rescued, if you will. But it being rescued doesn't mean that police immediately understand her situation. The reason a lot of laws have changed, state laws of, around human trafficking, it's not just to make it easier to catch the trafficker, but also to be less punitive toward victims of, of human trafficking. Oftentimes, certainly uh, uh, even now, but certainly in the past, when women, sometimes men, were arrested for prostitution, they were the prostitutes as opposed to being prostituted. There was, and there was a difference, of course. Uh, they were the prostitutes. So in other words, they were, they were criminalized. Uh, it doesn't matter what their, what their victim uh, status was, they were criminalized. The new Massachusetts human, human trafficking law basically looks, takes into account the possibilities, enormous possibilities, that large numbers of women, girls, because of, oftentimes we're talking about 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds, this often starts at, uh, uh, at 13. As I probably mentioned in the clip, I'm not sure the clip you saw, uh, I assume it was with Audrey Porter, uh, who was a former prostitute in Boston. She says, as many who fight human trafficking say, no 13-year-old, no 11-year-old no wakes up in the morning and says, Mom, I want to be a prostitute. That's not how it works. There's a level of exploitation that begins, as, as I've covered in uh, Underground Trade, and in a previous um, series on human trafficking, that begins in foster care, oftentimes, uh, that begins uh, in broken homes of various sorts, that begins in a school because a young woman uh, falls in love with a young guy, 
who turns out to be someone who exploits her. Um, we, uh, we glorify this term pimping. Uh, to this day, pimp my ride, uh, so on and so forth. You've heard it many times, right? Um, you know, Macs are glorified as com glorified comedians in some cases, as, as, as we know. Uh, but there's nothing at all funny. There's nothing at all glorious. There's nothing to be extolled about pimping. It is another form of trafficking. It is a human trafficker by another name. But yet, this is something, again, that is, that is rampant. I don't want to talk too long, because I'd rather have uh, uh, answer your questions. But let me just say, say this um, about the underground trade, about the series idea. The, the idea, again, was to look at roots, how people get from point A to point B. And I was largely looking at Asian women coming into the United States and going out of the United States, this, circu this circular path that occurs. But the fact of the matter is human trafficking occurs everywhere. I mean everywhere. The US State Department conducts something called the TIP uh, report. What the TIP report is is trafficking in persons reports. And it looks at countries everywhere to see the judge, according to uh, TIP uh, report one, two, and three, how a country is doing. It looks at various degrees of how a country is doing in fighting human trafficking. And the United States has improved, but the United States still has a long way to go itself. The United States had to include itself in this category many years ago after many countries complained that, look, we're losing citizens who are coming to the United States who are being exploited in the United States. How can you not include yourself? And uh, the whole survey of the, uh, the, the, the survey of human trafficking, if you will, increased exponentially with uh, Hillary Clinton's involvement with the State Department. She basically uh, took the State Department, which uh, also uh, was looking at human trafficking under George Bush, by the way. But she took this and, and basically expanded it. And, and we now have an ambassador on human trafficking uh, who, whose job it is to look not only, again, at what's happening around the world, but to look at the United States uh, as well. And so this point, so in the United States, uh, there is a, a, a bill that, that can't seem to get off the ground, that was um, uh, proposed by Caroline, uh, Caroline uh, Maloney of New York, a congresswoman who works on a human trafficking subcommittee in Washington. And what this would basically do is look at state by state who is doing a good job, which state is doing a good job, which state is doing a bad job, which state is doing a mediocre job in terms of, hum of, conduct, of com uh, confronting human trafficking. Massachusetts gets sort of like a B plus. Very few states get an A. Uh, North Carolina gets a D, uh, where you have various degrees of uh, human trafficking going, going on, of uh, people working on farms, working on plantations, working in slaughterhouses, of, of, again, to pay off debt. Florida doesn't do very well also. You have a huge degree of human trafficking that results from foster care. Children basically coming from, going from foster care into prostitution. Uh, there's a great deal of that out of Florida. In California, California has been fighting um, uh, to improve its human rights, um, uh, human trafficking uh, record as well. Some cities are worse than others uh, in terms of uh, um, in, in terms of con confronting human trafficking. Some have very good police uh, surveillance and intelligence, like San Francisco. Uh, San Francisco has been for a long time looking at the nexus between um, immigrant uh, exploitation of immigrants and exploitation of native-born. Uh, girls and, and women and boys and have found that uh, human traffickers uh, have basically gotten smarter and are basically starting to, uh, uh, to basically come up with all types of ways of disguising uh, the work that they do. And, and, in, and in New York, the same thing is true, but New York has a long way to go because New York, again, a lot of it starts in Queens, New York, and it's, and it's been spreading around the um, the East Coast, but now you have attorney generals throughout this entire area who are finally starting to say, huh, let's connect the dots. And let the best way to connect the dots is for us all to come together, as Martha Coakley has done with attorney generals throughout this area, to try to find a way to stop this, uh, uh, this underground trade. I'm going to just ask you to ask me questions, uh, because I could go on, obviously, for a long time to talk about 
Please. Um, what about places where, because I went to Amsterdam this summer, and the red light district, it's, it's pretty clear that it's okay there. Why wouldn't you say that? I would be more, I'd be conscious to look at that area because I, like, you know, a pimp, I guess, would bring them just to there to disguise it because it's okay. How can you regulate to see if people aren't there at their own will? You asked a great question. <laughs> I mean, that is a really key question, and it, it comes back to this. I've been in a sort of a debate, if you will, um, after writing a piece for Huffington Post about a town in Thailand called Pantia, and basically have been uh, getting uh, some pretty nasty notes from men <laughs> living in Thailand. Let's go to Amsterdam, and, and, it's, and it's related to your question, and I'll tell you why. The red light district in, Thai, in uh, Amsterdam is considered, oh, this is where prostitution happens because women are here voluntarily and, if, and this is a way to basically ameliorate or even solve problems of prostitution uh, because folks are here willingly. It's clear that this has nothing to do with human trafficking. That's the conclusion some have come to. But the former mayor of Amsterdam, working with the rapporteur uh, in The Hague, uh, and, and working with, uh, and working with um, a former prostitute in the, the, uh, uh, in the red light district, basically conducted a study t uh, three years ago and found out that as, much, uh, as many as 65%, perhaps 70% of the women in the red light district of Amsterdam are there either coerced or forced. Eastern Europe, they're coming in from the Ukraine, they're coming in from uh, Ethiopia and other places where you get a high level of smuggling that turns into trafficking from, um, uh, from the Horn of, Horn of Africa. Women coming in from China, coming in from Thailand, and some Dutch women uh, themselves, as well as uh, Russians uh, and uh, other nationalities. As many, again, 65 to 70 percent, they determine, are trafficked. Now, I sat down in a cafe talking with, um, talking with a man who gladly uh, uh, says, look, I think you're, you don't know what you're talking about. He says, I've been coming here for years. He, he is someone who caters to prostitutes. He says, I've been coming here for years. I've never spoken to anyone who was here against their will. And I said, what are they supposed to tell you? <laughs> I mean, I don't get it. What are they supposed to tell you? Oh, I'm here against my will. Uh, the first time I was in Amsterdam, I'll uh, be perfectly honest with you, I saw, a, um, I saw a man being chased down in the streets by pimps and beaten to death. This is no exaggeration. This was in the 1980s. I, I was, it was extraordinary. Uh, it, an African man chased through the streets, beaten to death. I was trying to figure out what had happened, and I went to the local police and said, this is what I... I saw uh, they were diligent in the sense of following up. But this case was something that was related, apparently, and I didn't know about this, this concept at the time, this notion of human trafficking. But it's, it, this, is what, this is, by the way, one of the reasons why I got uh, interested in this topic. Uh, this man apparently had actually tried to, uh, according to the police at least, was trying to get, I don't know if it was his sister or if it was his, uh, his relative of some sort, out of the trade, out of the life, and was beaten to death in the red light, light district. Now, again, the, you have studies that have shown that in spite of the argument that if you legalize prostitution, it leads to a lessening of human trafficking, that is not the case with, with Amsterdam. And there's, there are ty all types of studies, one out of Sweden uh, and others out of Norway, where they find that there is a correlation between um, just the, the notion of demand. If there's a demand for prostitution, then there will be a demand for human, uh, if there's, a, there's a correlation between human trafficking. The same thing is true with sex tourism of any sort. If you find, if you find, Thailand, for example, is is, is a well-known destination for sex tourism, and if you talk to women, it's very true. I, I've spoken to women who will never say this is something 
that they're doing against their will. But, but in speaking with them further, as I spoke to one woman from the Laotian border of Thailand, she said, the reason I'm here is because there are no jobs where I live. My sister came to Pattaya, Thailand uh, to, to work here. Um, I, and I, I don't have any skills. I, don't, I have no education. The only thing I can do is this kind of work. I said, if, if the alternatives were given to you, would you accept those alternatives? She said she would. Uh, and those alternatives included just the right to have an education. Without an education, without, uh, without any type of fundamental uh, way of making a living, she was left with the choice of selling, of selling her body. Please. Oh, no, no, I'm all set. <laughs> Thank you very but much. I do have a question. Please, please. Um, Rhode Island somewhat famously just got rid of its indoor, its legal, legalized indoor prostitution. The loophole, the famous yes, loophole. Yes, they're right. not street walkers, That's so right. um, it was legal indoors. Did you find, and you mentioned being in Providence, yep. was there any connection with this notion that prostitution, as long as it was inside, was legal? How does that play into your... Another, you another good question. Um, the um, non-governmental organizations working on behalf of women, as well as the police, said that was said basically when the loophole existed, they were dealing constantly uh, with uh, women being transported from Queens, uh, largely uh, Korean women working in massage parlors, but also uh, poor white women, poor, uh, uh, and again, the common denominator is usually class. Um, people of low income across the board, uh, Latina, uh, African American, uh, uh, Cape Verdean, all types of women who were basically being exploited inside, indoors, gentlemen's clubs, um, massage parlors, apartment houses. The, uh, you may remember uh, one case involving a two, um, Two young men, uh, two, two, uh, this was just two years ago, who were prosecuted uh, in, um, uh, in Providence, who, who basically brought in uh, three young women from the um, Poughkeepsie area of New York uh, and brought them to Providence. And just be before the, lo the loophole was closed, and thinking, wow, you know, they're indoors, no one's going to know. And if I keep them around the college area, they were, they, they were basically exploited in a, an apartment in, uh, around um, University of Rhode Island. Uh, if I keep them in this apartment area, you know, they will mix in with, um, with the students. Now, one of these young women came and went as she went, as she, at will. But what happened was that the pimps, in this case, said, if you bother to tell anyone, if you scream, if you talk aloud, if you say, I'm being exploited, if you say, you know, I'm being pimped, we will kill your family. And this, by the way, is major leverage uh, that you find um, uh, in, in it's a common denominator for both young women in this country who are exploited and young women who are exploited from overseas. The threat against their families, so quite often this is very real. Um, I'm sorry. Who are the groups that are controlling this? Who are the groups? Mm -hmm. um, all over. They, 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 the mafia involvement? Uh, well, actually, you know, it's funny. I, was, I asked a, uh, um, I'm forgetting his name right now, a uh, pretty well-known uh, cop, uh, police detective out of Providence. He said, surprisingly, the traditional mafia was not involved in the uh, the human trafficking of, not heavily involved in human trafficking in Providence uh, because they found other ways of making money, more lucrative ways of making money. Uh, during the loop, and it wasn't that they were not involved, they were involved to, to a degree, but the greatest involvement apparently, a lot of the freelancers, uh, you know, Mac de jour, you know, guys who think, you know, like they make money off of a, a young woman. Uh, some of it is the is Tong organizations. The Tong are Chinese uh, uh, organized crime, uh, mainly out of New York, operating between Queens Chinatown and New York Chinatown. Uh, the Chinatowns are very, very uh, involved in in human trafficking of, of both Chinese women and women who pass through 
uh, China or pass through Bangkok to, uh, coming to the United States, uh, heavily involved. The Korean um, organized crime, Mexican organized crime, Irish Americans, everyone. I mean, this is this is uh, this is not uh, this is the equal opportunity exploitation factory. You know, this is what happens. They, uh, but you, you have uh, a lot of it is organized crime, and a lot of a lot of these individuals are freelancers. Uh, the for a number of years, the number one country of origin where women were being exploited was um, was uh, the Philippines. Uh, this year, I think it's Mexico in, ter in terms of the in the United States tip report. Uh, but it's Mexico, it's Philippines, it's China, uh, and uh, it's uh, uh, it's Thailand. Now, this is this is of course to say women coming to this country. But again, the greatest exploitation are women already in this country. Uh, again, the young woman walking the street and uh, going to school in Dorchester. Literally, look at the Tavares case, if you will, but literally picked up off the streets and dragged into a van. You have this happening everywhere. I speak to a doctor for another series I'm working on, Manisha Sharma, out of uh, New York, uh, out, of, uh, out of the Bronx. And she says, Philip, I have seen case after case of young women, and in a few cases, young men, who have basically been literally dragged into cars or trucks, raped, exploited, used as fodder uh, for, uh, for, for traffickers. And that it's only been in recent years when, the, uh, when, he, when New York's, uh, when Ray Kelly, the commissioner for the New York police, and uh, the various district attorneys have basically come together, banded together, to try to figure out you know, uh, ways of stopping human trafficking. Now they haven't. Not at all. The traffickers, again, have gotten smarter. Uh, they, uh, most most uh, trade occurs not by going into an apartment or a massage parlor, but online through Craigslist or through uh, uh, Backpage.com, reading an ad saying, come to an all-night party, and reading, and basically you call the number. You're basically sent to one place. They want to determine if you're a cop, and then you're sent to another place. Uh, this, it's these guys and many women, by the way. Uh, some of them, some themselves, former victims of trafficking. Uh, I guess it's the it's sort of the Stockholm syndrome. Uh, in uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm I'm not really hypothesizing about the Stockholm syndrome, but I'm just making a juxtaposition. Uh, the uh, but you find, you know like that it's uh, it's a lot of people who are involved in this underground trade. Of themselves again, former victims, but they represent all types of criminal uh, be behavior, all types of criminal organizations, I should say, uh, in terms of uh, who they are, uh, uh, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of uh, ages, uh, in terms and sometimes in terms of occupations. You'd be surprised at some of the individuals who are involved in, in human trafficking uh, in this country, as we've seen in various busts around, uh, around this nation. Uh, from dentists in, in New Jersey to a guy who ran a braiding salon, hair braiding salon, out of Newark, uh, also out of New York, Newark, New Jersey. Yeah. Please. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to ask, um, do you find that there are um, government policies uh, which uh, sort of encourage trafficking or uh, sort of uh, policy, or policies which make, make, make trafficking uh, more practical? Uh, I know that uh, Sort of in, in, in effect, or is it more just sort of a matter of um, uh, you know the traffic not really being on government's radar for a long time? I know um, Canada recently got rid of its um, uh, visa program for uh, exotic dancers because they found that it was uh, encode, actually encouraging human trafficking, which was quite sort of the exact opposite of what they initially planned. Uh, I was wondering, do you have any, uh, any sort of well, oh yes. <laughs> well, I got to tell you, that everyone so far, all these questions are really good. <laughs> they, I mean, they're really good because here is what. Um, think about it. What? It's interesting to see when, when uh, the rare occasion when Republicans and Democrats come together over anything, and they still haven't come together, by the way, over human trafficking. The reason uh, Caroline uh, Maloney's bill is uh, being held up is because of. Uh, uh, Basically, the um, 
the problems in Washington in terms of communicating. But one thing that some of them will agree on is that one reason, one desperate reason for the need for immigration reform is because until immigration uh, reform is uh, actually reformed, that many individuals, according to, um, um, excuse me, uh, my allergies are backing up, according to um, Louis D. Uh, Sabika, who is the ambassador of human trafficking uh, for the US State Department, he says one desperate reason why immigration reform is needed is because as a government policy, the notion of bringing in guest workers uh, and, not, and not having a formalized guest worker program leads to extraordinary levels of labor trafficking. And there was a thin line between labor trafficking and sex trafficking. Some of the women I've spoken with who come into, who've come into the United States to work in um, Chinese restaurants, for example, have been housed in, uh, in apartments where they are the only woman. Uh, or, uh, and you can imagine the problems that result for, for these individuals. I've spoken to uh, individuals in, um, out of Fresno, California, who work in the fields there, who, um, who basically pick the crops that we eat. Uh, and one man I spoke with said, look, um, I haven't been paid in, in three years, because he's paying off debt. Now, if immigration reform were to occur, and he could come forward and say, "Look, uh, you know, I'm, a, uh, you know, I'd like to apply for for, for citizenship." And uh, the, the 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 very people who pay him, or I should say, who don't pay him, they would have be in a less they'd be in a less powerful position. They're now in a powerful position because they basically can uh, uh, the, the money is owed to um, how do I explain this? He they're in a powerful position because he is. He's basically the peon. He's the pawn in this, uh, in, this, in this equation. And if he could basically negotiate his existence in this country, legally negotiate his existence in this country, he would be in a less uh, uh, vulnerable position. And this is what Louis de Sabeca was saying, that uh, you need immigration reform in order to halt the type of super exploitation that occurs in labor, uh, tra in, in terms of labor trafficking. Uh, and again, the thin line between labor trafficking and sex trafficking is, uh, is, is super thin, thin, thin indeed. Does anyone have any clinics? Next problem. Oh, thank you. Oh, that, yeah, that towel is just great. No, this is fine. Thank you. No, oh, that's all right. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, she's about to ask your question. I'm going to jump in and ask you to tell us how we can get on a website and hear your series because I heard it and it was amazing right. and it was trafficking to me is it is very obscure and I don't really understand it and I or I made more of it than it is kind of and I loved your series so tell us how we can listen to it well I appreciate it sure um, if you go if you um, go to wgbhnews.com just look up uh, human trafficking and a series the, the first series and the second series pops up. The first series is on looking at sex trafficking in New England and the role of male squads. The second series, uh, Underground Trade, uh, is, looks at, again, uh, the various routes and the connections, connecting the dots between what's happening overseas and what's happening here. Uh, it's called Underground Trade. You can Google it, and I think, it's one, I think these days is the first thing that pops up. Uh, the, the series is also in Huffington Post. Uh, up until uh, part six. This is an eight-part series. We're posting part seven and eight sometime this week. Um, so and, is, I'm to post. is that available for purchase by the library? Oh no, you don't need to purchase it. No, no. no you, it's free. It's free. Yeah, you can you it's uh, you can download it. Uh, it it's downloadable uh, MP3. You can download it as uh, to your um, to your iPod or iPad <laughs> or even it, or to your telephone too. Oh yeah. Well, no, no, no. no some, some people still purchase, but I'd rather, I'd rather folks just, uh, just, I'd rather you hear it than, uh, than having, having to purchase anything. Well, my question is, um, you mentioned the Fresno workers, and I'm trying to figure out if they, and he says he hasn't been paid. Right. So, is he a, a sort of an indentured servant, or is he getting paid by peace? 
or, or by food or something? Oh uh, no, he's he's actually when he says he's not getting paid, there is there, there is um, there is some payment that occurs uh, because the whole notion of keeping it just legal, uh, just legal. There's something. Uh, uh, but it's not minimum wage, for example. It's not even sub-minimum wage. It's, he was making, I think at the time I spoke with him, something like $1.50 an hour. Not even by the piece of, um, of not even by the fruit that he was picking, but he, he, he was making the money in the context of $1.50 an hour. And that whatever he made, if he owed money, <clears throat> that is to say, for his rent, he was charged for rent, and, uh, and there was, there were, 12 or 13 of them sleeping uh, in this one um, uh, one rooming house. And, and then he was charged rent. And the rent, of course, exceeded the amount of money that he was actually pay, being paid. So that's how he ended up with no, with no money, exactly. And it's felt that if immigration laws were reformed, that, um, that employers, and it's usually not, uh, employers usually try to keep their hands clean, by the way. They usually hire middlemen or middlewomen to negotiate these things so that they can say to a reporter, it has nothing to do with me. You should talk to the middleman. But of course, they're completely aware of what the middleman or middle person is doing in terms of this, uh, this, type, of, uh, this type of trade. You have <laughs> Fresno for, um, for a while, uh, according to the American um, Index on Poverty, uh, was considered like the poorest uh, congressional uh, a, a district in the country, the Fresno area, a lot of a lot of, a lot of it had to do with this uh, this level of exploitation. Fresno, uh, the Sioux area in uh, in uh, the Dakotas, and of course the Delta area in um, uh, in Mississippi, Louisiana, and uh, northern Maine. Um, northern Maine has had a major problem with human trafficking, by the way, uh, in terms of both labor trafficking and sex trafficking. Uh, places that sometimes you wouldn't be surprised uh, where this happens, it happens. I have a question which is actually for you and Professor Dunlap. Um, you mentioned that most victims end up getting arrested because of prostitution. I'm, I'm wondering, since they are victims, are there any remedies for them through, if not VAWA, or if not solely on the Trafficking Victims Protection Act? Can, can they also tap into anything in VAWA since they are victims of violence, essentially. Well, you, you answered it. Uh, they are protected, um, ostensibly at least, under the Victims Protection Act. They, are, they, they, they can receive, if they're, if they're from an, another country, if they're immigrants, they're protected under something that's called, they could receive something that's known as the T1 visa, which is a trafficking visa. Uh, they, there's that, they have the potential to receive the trafficking uh, a visa, but that's hard to prove sometimes. To prove that, you, uh, you basically have to say, quite often you have to agree to testify against the person who exploited you. I cannot even begin to tell you the amount of fear. I mean, you can imagine the amount of fear of testifying against someone who's, who's taken an iron, and this is a real case, taken an iron in bread and put it up against your face. Uh, this was a, the Tavares case. Or, or taking, uh, or, or, or breaking the legs of, of, uh, of your brother. This was the case of the woman uh, whom, who I interviewed out of, out of New York, connected with the uh, uh, in labor trafficking in New York uh, Asian Women's Center. So there is that, that protection. And, uh, and Massachusetts is trying to make it um, a lot easier by trying to protect the identities, um, basically giving more meat to the, uh, to the human trafficking law to protect the identities of, uh, of women, in some cases men, who are exploited. <laughs> and so you have that remedy. Or, you have to excuse me, I have the worst allergies in the world. <laughs> so you, but you, you do have that, that as, a, as one response. Professor, I don't know if you want to add to that. I, I have nothing to add. The, the trafficking stuff in VAWA, I know very little about, which is why I'm delighted we have <laughs> Mr. Martin. I, I have nothing to add, sorry. It's a, uh, but every state now, I think, except Massachusetts, for a long, Massachusetts was the first state to, one of the first states to propose a human trafficking law. That is to say, they give teeth uh, to, uh, to, um, to, to basically the notion that uh, uh, oftentimes people who are considered uh, prostitutes are in fact being prostituted. 
to give more uh, coverage for victims, to uh, give the police uh, greater surveillance power, to put money into the uh, coffers of police departments to actually investigate human trafficking. It's one of the first to propose it and one of the last to actually pass a human trafficking law. Almost every other state that passed a human trafficking law by 2011, except Massachusetts. Massachusetts was, was one of six states that had not passed a human trafficking law. But over the last three years, I think it's only two states that now are without a human trafficking law uh, in, uh, in the country. Vermont passed it just before Massachusetts did. Uh, I mean, it's, it's amazing to think about, you, you think about New England as being more progressive in this context, and, but a lot of it was bickering over the amount of money that, was, that, that was required to go into the coffers to protect, to set up safe houses for, for, for victims, to basically um, prosecute these cases. And the, the Boston Police Department, I spoke to uh, uh, Kathy Nee, who is a uh, deputy superintendent of the Boston Police Department, and she's featured in the series Underground Trade. And she says, even to this day, they're not getting, uh, they're getting uh, uh, almost no money to basically go after uh, human traffickers. And these folks, by the way, if you have human trafficking, you don't just have human trafficking. You usually have drug trafficking that's concomitant with this. You usually have um, uh, arms trafficking. These things all go hand in hand. So you're talking about individuals who are, who have a lot of money. And so police departments uh, that are basically dealing with bare budgets right now, to go after a lot of human traffickers uh, is very, very difficult. That's why it's believed that the arrest and prosecution of human trafficking in this country, it, it barely, it, it's, uh, uh, it's barely the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the vast majority, I think it's safe to say, the vast majority of human traffickers get away with it. It's, uh, that's unfortunate, but that's, that's, that's the case right now. Anyone else? Uh, I, I know you've got to get going. Thank you very now much. Now that we're all really good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming, guys. Right. Thank you very much. Well, that's what he's talking about.